Welcome back to the Wiser Together series. My name is Shane Farmer, and I'm thrilled to be your host for this session called Iron Sharpens Iron. So far in this study, we've learned what growth looks like, how a group should attend to all the areas of growth, and how to get and receive counsel. But there is a lot more to learn about how it is that we actually help each other grow. How do we come alongside others in a way that sharpens them? How, how do others play a role in sharpening us? Now, if you've noticed over the last few weeks that your group just hasn't had enough time to get through all the questions in the study, that's okay. There are intentionally more questions provided than one group could ever get through. Your host can try to discern the questions that will best serve your group where it's at. If you'd like, you can always set aside a little time during the week to look at these questions on your own. We encourage your group to pray together, but not everyone in your group has prayed aloud in a setting like this. So just ask for a volunteer who would like to pray or even break down into smaller groups so that there's not as much pressure to pray in front of the larger group. Even if several people pray and the praying seems to be coming around the circle, please don't feel any pressure to do anything in the group you don't feel like doing. It's okay to pass. God hears silent prayers just as well as he hears audible ones. So with that said, pull out your guide if you have it and follow along as Bill talks about how we sharpen one another in community. If your faith could be depicted as a blade, how sharp is it right now? Is it so dull that it would be not worth much use? Is it so sharp that it's the most useful knife in the drawer? Or is it somewhere in between? None of us would argue that the difference between a person whose faith is dull and one whose faith is razor sharp is quite noticeable. When we get dull, it shows up in lots of ways. We get low on passion. We become irritable. We've got no fire in the belly. We're lifeless. Our desire for God is low. Feeling of affections toward Christ diminish, and we seldom share our faith. You kind of get the picture. On the other hand, when we are sharp in our faith, it shows up like Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, life in the eyes, passion, love for God and others. None of us want to be the dull blade that can't really serve its purpose. It can't really do very much. We want to be sharp. A sharp blade is useful. It can fulfill its purpose. You can do a lot with a sharp blade. This proverb is telling us that more goes on in relationships than advice on what to do. Relationships fundamentally change who we are. Iron can't sharpen itself. It only can become sharp when encountering more iron. In the same way, you can't sharpen yourself fully. You can become sharp when encountering other Christ followers in your life. Faith goes from dull to sharp in the context of community. We have an ability to assist others, not just in what they do, but in who they are. This week is about learning how we can gather in such a way to change a person inside and out. In week one, we define what growth looks like. The outcome of a changed person is increased love for God and others. But what leads to that kind of change? And how do people play a part in that? There are four primary paths that lead toward the change in a Christian's life. These are knowing truth, experiencing God, faith in action, and of course, relationships. I'm going to talk to you about the role that a small group community plays in each of these four areas. First, knowing truth. When a person is in a down spot, they almost always need to hear some truth. Anytime we drift into an unhealthy place, at the root of it, we've begun to think some wrong stuff, and we're in short supply of being able to think of the right stuff. When we're at our worst, no one would want a recording of the ways we talk to ourselves in our heads. Our thoughts become really hateful. You idiot, you're a loser, you screwed up, you can't get anything right. Why don't you just quit? You're never gonna get there. These are self-hating lies. A good small group will spot this in a heartbeat and start to combat those lies with words of truth. They'll tell you straight up, those words are not true, they're lies. The truth is you're a loved child of God's. He believes in you, that's why he died for you. You are his unique creation. 
You have to take those thoughts captive, as the scriptures say, and choose to believe truth and not lies. Faith sharpening groups speak the truth to each other. One way to really drill down to the core lies we believe is to pay attention to situations where we react out of proportion to a certain circumstance. One red flag to look at in our own lives and in the lives of others is when we react to a situation way stronger than the situation warrants. Anytime you hear someone turning a molehill into a mountain, that should put you on high alert. This usually means someone heard or perceived a message that was not intended to be heard. For example, take Becky. She's furious with her husband because she felt he ignored her at a social gathering. A good small group could affirm Becky's feelings, given that her husband ignored her, but a great small group would go deeper than that. Becky, it makes sense to us that you're angry, but it appears that your anger is out of proportion to this circumstance. I wonder if this situation sent you a message that was stronger than it really should have. If you were to ask Becky what message she felt her husband was sending her when he didn't talk to her, she might start to say things like, well, you don't matter, or you aren't worth my time, or you're invisible. Most likely, her husband does not believe those things, nor would he ever say them. This is what she heard because this is a message she believes deep down. When you can drill down to these messages, you can then speak truth to them and combat them. Then be sure to speak the truth with Scripture once that faulty message has been exposed. We tell others the truth about them, we also tell others the truth about God. Often, when we get under stress, we can start reverting to images of God that are straight from the pit of hell. They're not true at all. We start believing He doesn't care about us, that maybe even He's angry with us and hates us. We picture Him ceaselessly disappointed and embarrassed of us. The list goes on of lies about God that are just plain false. A good small group reminds each other of the truth about God. We never outgrow our need to hear the basic truths over and over and over again. Gang, we hear lies about God every day, coming at us at mock speed and in oceanic volumes. If we're only getting a dribble of truth once in a while, how are we ever going to offset that? We need each other to speak truth into us. This isn't hard. A good phrase to remember when we're speaking truth to each other is, I know you already know this, but it's just good to remember this or that. Then fill in the blank with whatever the truth is. If you just spout off truth, someone might feel that you're being condescending or rattling off stuff they already know. Most of the time, we have heard and memorized the truths before. But when we get down, we struggle to believe what we already know. So we just need to be reminded. Maybe you could commit that little phrase to memory. I know you already know this, but it's good to remember dot, dot, dot. The second path toward transformation is experiencing God. Experiencing God is something that primarily comes through quiet times of prayer and reflection on Scripture and so. I want to talk to you, though, about the role a small group plays in the very experience of God. We've already talked about stopping to pray in week one. I want to address another aspect of this. 1 John 4 verse 12 says, No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. We don't get to experience God in a similar way we experience each other, not yet anyway. We can't see Him. We can't physically reach out and touch Christ's hands. We can't hear His voice in the same way we can hear each other's. The Apostle John is acknowledging that fact right here. No one has ever seen God, but, but, he says, if we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. Here's what I believe John is getting at. It's real hard for a person to imagine God caring enough to sit across from them in a group setting and listen with true empathy. Until they experience someone with the Spirit of God in them doing just that for them. It's real hard to accept that God's love for us is real and not just a fairy tale until a Christian brother or sister speaks lovingly and speaks truthfully to us in a group setting. It's real hard to imagine how gracious and merciful God is when we keep on sinning against Him until we confess our sins to a group 
and we see them respond with God's grace and God's mercy firsthand, right before our eyes. You will never know how much power there is in simply being present. In doing so, you help mediate God's presence to other people. This is a mysterious thing, I fully realize. However, if you've experienced the love of God through people in this way before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We need to demonstrate God's love for each other because it helps us to experience God's love for real. The third path toward transformation is faith in action. A good small group actually plays a huge role in this area of your life. Throughout church history, a huge value has been put on what used to be called sharing your testimony. There are churches still today that every time they gather, people have a chance to share a testimony with others. What this is referring to is the practice of sharing real-life examples of how God showed up in your life. Small group should be a place where you're hearing testimonies of God showing up in each other's lives almost every single week. When Joe shares how he overcame a sin pattern, you start to believe that you can overcome your sin pattern as well. When Tyler tells you how God used him to lead one of his friends to faith, what effect is that going to have on you? You're going to start putting more energy into loving those people who are far from God in and around your life. Hearing others' examples of how they're applying their faith is critical to you helping apply your faith. A good small group shares examples of how faith gets put into action. Also, a lot of groups utilize their relationships to provide accountability. Here are some ways this could possibly work. After you check in about what's been going on in your life that week, and if it becomes clear that you need to grow in a certain area, a great thing for you to do to help motivate yourself is to make a commitment to your whole group. Simply say, hey, I want to commit to all of you that between now and this time next week, I'm going to take my spouse on a date. This commitment is crystal clear. If you show up the following week and you haven't done it, you have to face the group. Accountability alone is often enough to motivate us toward action. Of course, there are other times when verbal accountability alone just isn't enough. Sometimes there are unhealthy patterns in us that need a little more skin in the game. Is there any length you would not go to to cut out sinful patterns in your life and start God-honoring habits in their place? A few years ago, I heard a high-profile leader say that they can't miss a workout or they'll owe a friend hundreds of dollars. This seemed absurd when I first heard about it. But after thinking about it, I thought, hey, if it works, why not? How badly do you want to change some pattern in your life? Is there anything you would not be willing to do to change it? Your community can be a part of that in all kinds of creative ways. The final path toward transformation is relationships. This, of course, is what Iron Sharpening Iron is talking about. You'll never find an Olympic champion who trained in secrecy and in isolation. They always have a coach. Usually they have a coach and some training partners that push them along. We've all heard the analogy of the fire. If you separate the logs, they each go out. It's only when you bring multiple logs together that a fire can burn brightly over a long period of time. Well, this has always been true about Christianity as well. We don't burn bright in secrecy and isolation. We don't burn bright standing all alone. We burn bright when we're next to others who have the fire inside them as well. Here's my encouragement to you. If you already have an inner circle small group community that you connect well with and feel great about, then just make sure you apply what you're learning. Speak truth into each other, mediate God's presence, share examples that encourage putting faith into action. For the rest of you, I encourage you to start developing a web of relationships at church. Doing this study was a great example of how to broaden your relationships. Also, go to connection events at the church. Meet people. Take some risks. Develop some friendships. There are a couple of different ways to pursue community. One way is for your church to randomly drop you into a group of people that you don't know. Uh, the fit is sometimes great and sometimes not so great. Another way is for you to take ownership over your own developing friendships and hand-select those that you really believe are the right people to be in an inner circle, small group community with. I think we all know that the best small group communities 
are self-formed by people who already had a sense of connection with each other. They were friends. They actually would want to hang out with these people. We are called to love everyone, but you can't manufacture the kind of friendships that we're talking about here. Iron sharpens iron because the iron literally rubs off on the other piece of iron. If you're going to hang around someone enough for them to really rub off on you, it should probably be someone that you actually like to be around. So take responsibility to invest yourselves in relationships at church. The payoff will not disappoint. Now I'm going to speak to those of you who attend our South Barrington campus specifically. We're making it more accessible than ever for you to get connected with others and for you to put your faith into action alongside your small group. Every section in our auditorium is now on the way toward becoming a section community. We're talking about a small church of 100 people in the midst of this large place. Every one of these sections has a leader who works with a team of volunteers to provide easy opportunities for everyone in their section to get connected with each other. If you're looking to get more connected, or if you want to help connect those who are isolated, you can jump right in on this. These little micro-communities help people connect with others, which leads to the formation of lots of small groups. The incredible thing about this is that every small group gets to see each other while they're at church, get to save seats for each other. You see how this works. Plus, every small group leader can get support and direction from their section leader before or after any service. And anytime you or your group are looking to serve, these little micro-communities are the perfect place. Sections have prayer teams, serving trips, connection ministries, small group ministry, and so much more. And hey, if you give your section a chance and ultimately feel like it's just not a fit for you, all you have to do is move over a section and find one that does.